Hi, and welcome to Becoming Multiplanetary. I'm Rich Albee, one of your co-hosts on today's new weekly podcast for Total Space, Becoming Multiplanetary. Here, we're going to be talking about various topics related to the preparation of humanity and our journey to becoming a multiplanetary species. Firstly, I'd like to invite the other co-hosts this week to introduce themselves. I'm another Space Nut, a regular voice on the channel. And I'm Ryan from the Space Updates. I also host another podcast called Talking Space. Let's get stuck into today's episode. So for the first topic of today's discussion, guys, um, I was thinking to begin uh, a little close to home, actually. Uh, We're going to probably start today with uh, the topic of Artemis, uh, namesake, twin sister of Apollo, and discussing humanity's return to the moon. So, Ryan, first thoughts, uh, Artemis, you know, what's what's your uh, impressions with Artemis so far uh, as a program? Uh, the Artemis program, I think it's long, long overdue because we haven't been back to the moon since, what, 1972, 73, since the, uh, all those Saturn programs and Apollo, Apollo missions and everything. But... Um, it's really, really promising that we're finally going back to the moon and everything. Um, but the rocket itself, it's, as we all know, it's mass con- controversy over it due to the cost, everything going on, then all the private companies getting involved and all the different crew capsules. And it's, at this moment in time, from my point of view, it's, it seems to be getting a bit of a mess. And the time scale and everything's just becoming very very sensitive so one little slip up and it's just gonna it could quite easily crumble because they want they definitely want to hit that 2024 hit deadline but um what do you guys think of the uh the actual sls rocket i think uh, my two cents on the matter is going to be something like this um i understand with nasa you know, the first thing they worry about is their budget, and rightfully so. You've only got a limited amount of resources to work on a specific project. Um, so one of the ways I feel they've tried to to keep within budget like this is to reuse or, you know, use some of the parts from the shuttle system that they had left over. Now, the only issue when you use parts such as these is you're going to be inheriting sorry inheriting the technical debt of those parts so if you're trying to put old parts in a new system maybe the old part wasn't designed exactly for said new system so you need to engineer around the problem um and you know whilst engineering around the problem once or twice doesn't really add up to much when you have to do it tens of times hundreds of times uh, you know and that just racks up the cost. And I think that's what's happened uh, with the SLS like we've seen here. Uh, What do you think, Space Nut? I mean, I'd say my biggest gripe with the SLS is how non-reusable it is. You know, we're we're building this rocket that's taking men and women back to the moon. And, you know, like the, the, the rocket is not reusable. That in itself makes no sense, you know, especially when you take into account that SpaceX have like a 10 year lead on the majority of companies out there that are now starting to work on reusable technology. And, you know, that NASA are not even attempting it with the SLS, which is a rocket for four years from now. That being said, I do also understand that NASA are a public service provider. They are dictated by government funding. And as a result, I'd say it'd be silly to cancel the SLS with the amount of money that's already gone at it. How about yourself, Ryan? For me personally, um, I think the SLS rocket, uh, it it should still go ahead. I know many think it should be abandoned due to the cost, but I think they spent that much money on it now. They literally cannot cancel it. Because literally billions and billions of pounds have gone, uh, pounds or dollars even, sorry. <laughs> but uh, just that much money's gone into it. They just have to complete the mission at the end of the day. They can't, you can't just wipe off billions of dollars of money and just say, yeah, just put that in the bin. We'll just use a Starship instead. It's just not out of the question. Um, but I think the key, key role is getting the gateway in, in place as well as all these lunar landers 
what do you guys think of the the gateway? It's definitely something I'd like to see. Um, we know that uh, we've had a few contractors been brought on board already to build various segments of it. Uh, whether it's going to be ready or not prior to the first lunar landing, I'm not so sure on that one. However, the idea of having this gateway, you know, in, in orbit around the moon, and just having a you know a, a landing system from the gateway, it seems efficient to be able to ferry, you know, transport people, cargo, back and forth. It definitely seems like an efficient way to go about it. And uh, it also helps facilitate with communication as well. You know, it can be used as a communication relay between Earth and the Moon. Uh, what are your thoughts about that, SpaceNet? I mean, I know I've seen a lot of stuff on Lunar Direct, and, you know, there is a lot of people that would argue... As uh, Ryan correctly pointed out, you know, is there any need for the Lock G if you're using Starship? Um, but then at the same time, I feel, although it's not going to be ready, ready for the initial Artemis uh, missions, I think going forward to use it as a scientific research station like we do with the ISS, like we do with everything we send to space, really, they've all got miniature labs and stuff on board. You know, and and actually do groundbreaking science, you know, close to the moon, and actually say, okay, we've got a science module here, uh, attach it to the lunar gateway, and within minutes of samples being taken from the surface, they can be sent to a orbiting station, and. You know, be, be analysed in almost real time from taking them out of the ground. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right there. You know, having it as a, a scientific research outpost, um, similar to much similar to how the ISS operates around Earth at the moment. I mean, you already see, <clears throat> in terms of the ISS, there they already send experiments there. You know, there's companies that request for these experiments to be taken to the ISS. Uh, they'll pay for it to be, you know, put up there, and and they learn a lot from, you know, operating in the micro G environment and stuff like that. And there's a lot of materials research that goes on there as well. Now, with the lunar gateway, that's going to present you with an entirely different environment. Again, I wouldn't think it'd be too different, but still, it's another micro G environment around the orbit of the moon. Um, so you could have maybe moon-based experiments there or you could even send experiments over from earth to, to be hosted at the lunar gateway as well or more interestingly because it's a gateway you could even use it as a cast off platform for your own uh, you know science if you know if we can get university teams sending rovers to the the lunar gateway and deploy down to the lunar surface but you know by by trying professionals that's that you know can almost ensure uh, mission safety at that point. That's that's something that could also be used uh, by the lunar gateway. Yeah, definitely. Something I'd like to see it used as well is you know there's a lot of similar things I'm seeing nowadays whereby you're seeing like a class of children at a school. And they're getting the opportunity to put their own little experiment in space, you know, and then the opportunity to to bring children into this sort of scientific curiosity that they have, you know, bring, bringing that in and being able to, you know, show their experiment up on the Lunar Gateway, you know, something for the kids to be like, you know, wow, that's that's really great. Yeah, I mean, there's various companies sending payloads to space already, isn't there? Like Nickelodeon sent slime um recently as part of a marketing campaign a uk um retail outlet sent a chicken nugget to space gained an apogee of twenty five thousand feet i think i actually remember seeing a picture of that recently i did wonder what that was about <laughs> and there is the the whole hot potato of is their life isn't there there's you know there's some quite controversial um experiments that have gone on where the instruments may or may not have failed uh i know that some of them may be debated some uh accepted as fact 
uh, you know, there's there is there is that potential to go wrong. But as we send more humans out there and we continue to uh, keep a man's presence on the moon, you know, like as as Ryan was just saying, the, the the tagline is "Go and stay on the moon." You know, like can we uh, afford to do that? You know, that is is the budget big enough? Um, will a change in command and administration alter the timeline of Artemis? Will SpaceX go there as a private company like he lunch jokes about before NASA get there? These are all sort of questions that you've got to think of when you're thinking of these accords and how to go forward um, with becoming multiplanetary and, and becoming a spacefaring species. You have to think about what happens when, you know, everybody's making shots. You know, if China are shooting for the moon and Russia are shooting for the moon and the U.S. are shooting for the moon and then you've got private companies and, and it's about, where you know, where where's the hard limit? You know, where can you say, OK, this is acceptable and this isn't? And obviously to achieve the uh, the cargo mission to and from the gateway, they're going to have to do an, a Dragon XL version. Um, which I believe is in production at the moment. Um, I don't know if you guys are seeing anything on that, have you? So, Dragon XL, yeah, good question. Um, we saw a concept, really nice render. Should be de de delivering uh, supplies to the Lunar Gateway. Uh, direct from SpaceX, our favourite reusable rockets architecture. So, if I'm right, isn't the... Dragon XL doesn't it just have a an expanded trunk compartment or is there another different feature to it? No, the Dragon XL is a full uh, ind independent vehicle. It's it's got a great uh, mass. It can be launched on the Falcon Heavy direct to the Lunar Gateway. Um, it's really worth checking out. I will link it under this podcast. Uh, I will link a bit of research on that, likely. If not, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. If you haven't seen the video, I'm sure um, you know any anybody listening will have uh, likely seen the SpaceX Dragon XL concept. But if not, I will leave a link underneath. In terms of the human landing systems, um, we've got Blue Origin, um, and we've got SpaceX, and we've got Dynetics. Obviously, Blue Origin with the national team with uh, their partly re reusable SpaceX going for the fully reusable rocket and everything. And then we've got Dynetics with their unique design. I like to call it a Coke can on wheels, so the, uh, the Rover one with a little frame around it with a couple of. But I think Dynetics is the, the winner on the human landing systems. What's your guys' favourite? Yeah, well, I've got to say, my, my own personal favourite is the uh, lunar version of the Starship developed by SpaceX, um, mainly because if you look at what they've done there, they've moved the engines up to uh, the upper half of the ship there, and uh, Elon said that they did that because if they were to have all that thrust at the bottom of the ship, all that would happen is it would displace the the ground and it would just sink into a crater effectively so in order to combat that they've moved the thrust further up the ship which means that it's not going to be as close to the ground when it comes down and uh, therefore shouldn't displace uh, as much if if any so obviously we won't know exactly how efficient it will be until they've got it in production and we see some uh, maybe a displacement test somehow um but that's definitely like my favourite out of them. Um, Space that how about you? Yeah, I'm going to have to agree. I definitely like the SpaceX one. I mean, ultimately, if I could go there, I don't mind what's taken me there. I have previously said on Talking Space that I'd love to ride the alpaca to the moon just for the memes, uh, which is naturally the Dynetics one, as Ryan just pointed out. Um, but yeah, I think, like, the difference is one of them is like economy class, one of them's like luxury class, and then the other one I feel is, um, well, too political to discuss on this show, really.
So then, cycling back to the uh, the lunar version of the space, uh, the starship there, uh, space there, is the idea being that um, we've we've seen with the original starship design that it could have that crude uh, the, uh, crude section at the, the nose cone, or it could effectively, as we've seen, be like a giant space shark and have have the the cargo section there. Is it the intent for the lunar version of that to have the same differentiation, like one maybe with, with a crew area or one just for cargo, for delivering cargo to the moon and whatnot? I mean, I think initially we're going to see uh, the Dragon XL, like Ryan's pointed out. Uh, really good that SpaceX came up with that creation because it's going to lay a lot of foundational work out. But you're right, I mean, these crewed and un uncrewed variants. I think we're going to see a lot of uncrewed um, testing and robotic missions towards the lunar surface from SpaceX before we send crew with it. But it's uh, exciting to know that, you know, there's the Starship and, and the lunar variant Starship, which is a really important thing for, um, you know, the, the Accords especially. You know, SpaceX once again showing that they do listen to concerns, you know, like they have done with Starlink, putting the reflectors on satellites to appease the astronomy community. And once again, they're taking real thought and consideration at how to land on the moon and preserve the moon at the same time. Yeah, and, and bringing up that Starlink, actually, you know, they, they really did listen to the community. And, you know, they saw, right, OK, we really didn't realise how reflective these surfaces would be so we need to figure out a way where we can just maybe change the possible refractiveness of the the surface as it were and it's my understanding that they've managed to do that now to some extent on the the newer models and also uh if i remember correctly at the time of recording i think we've seen a few of the starlink satellites deorbit already now haven't we yeah there's uh there's been a few uh deorbits Starlink satellites at this point. We did talk a little bit about that on Talking Space, um, about how there was these mystery objects that could have been a meteorite but burnt up more like a satellite. And there's some speculation as to whether that was a SpaceX Starlink satellite or whether it was a piece of old space junk or whether it was indeed a meteorite. Speaking of space junk, that's another thing the Accords talks about, you know, and, and that's actually a real, uh, real uh, problem that, well, it's not a problem as of right now, but as we've seen in very recent times, we did have, or was it two pieces of debris pass by within, or oh, how many was it? It's like 13, 11 meters. Or um, 11 meters, the pass between um, two objects in low Earth orbit recently. We can see that it's now getting to the point where we really need to start thinking about doing something about this. And, um, and there are a few companies that are starting to rise to the challenge, but I don't know how far they've gotten yet, like space junk recovery companies. And how does that look lunar side? Because if everybody's making a moon shoot off the back of Artemis, you know, like, how much of a problem is it going to be um, in lunar orbit? You know, are we going to fill it with satellites and space junk and other various bits? Or do we want to actually rethink how we're doing it? You know, do we want to make a fresh start and, and keep those planets preserved? Because ultimately, you know, we're visiting these planets. They've been there long before our species, even we are visitors, first and foremost, that we should be protecting these uh, celestial bodies and, and the like. Well, by the very definition, we are aliens on the surface of the moon. And also, you know, we've got to remember the, the really simple fact of the moon's low, low moon orbit, as it were, is even less area than the Earth. So I think the best way to, to approach something like this would maybe to have a register. And once that register is full, have no more launched up until some of these uh, older satellites deorbit. Um, and, and a register should be maintained by the, the moon's, I don't know, government or local authority or whatever. So that way we've got all the registered satellites and so long as they don't overflow the list, it 
theoretically shouldn't be a problem. I think that's about the only way you'd really approach something like that, unless you have any other ideas as to how you might approach it. I mean, writing these policies now is important, isn't it? Actually knowing what we're doing beforehand. Um, like, I, I feel it is important to sort of get these things over and done with and think about them going forward because, you know, there's there's already a, a fairly big uh, space junk problem here on Earth. Do we want to go off the back of these, once again, future historic events like Artemis missions? and screw other planets up and I don't feel that's you know that's that's not justice to what we're there to do we're supposed to be exploring in peace so I feel it's definitely something that needs monitoring however they do it so if you're listening in to this week's episode at this point and uh, you're not really sure on uh, how much space junk there is out there or or how serious the issue is if you just look up something called the Kessler syndrome or the Kessler effect, you'll see um, that if only maybe two or three pieces of junk collide, you can see how bad that can be. And then to gauge a bigger picture of just how much um, trackable junk is in space, I definitely recommend it trying uh, stuff in space. Just give it a quick search, or I may link it under this episode. And it's definitely worth checking out. You know, that's that's the things we can track. That's things that are big enough to track. There is a lot of uh, micro pieces of space junk, but we're just unable to track the way smaller pieces. I think one of the ways we should really incentivize the de-junking of space now is to think of it like um, think of it like your local scrap heap. You know, if you bring some of this debris back, you know, you might be able to use some of the mineral value of its content or maybe reuse the the materials in some way. And I think you're going to see a lot of this sort of salvage kind of take off as these space junk companies uh, sort of come out of the ground. And do you not think uh, setting a standard bounty based on the value of the satellite uh, for its recovery that would quite, uh, you know, in, incentivize um, a lot of startup companies because, you know, we, we live in a modern era, let's face facts. Startups appear. Uh, we've got lots of little startups that have got NASA grants for presenting a really good idea forward. Now, think about how many people will try and solve the space junk problem if there was a bounty on them. You know, if you said, okay, I estimate the value of the parts inside this to be. You know, I, I don't know, X, Y, or Z. Um, and then challenge private companies to try and claim that bounty. Well, you could almost have it like a broker system, whereby you'd have someone who actually knew the value of the components in the spacecraft, and they'd be like, okay, I'd be willing to pay this much to have it retrieved. And then they have it retrieved, and then, you know, they pay the company, and then they receive the parts in return. You know, I'm not sure if there's something that could be worked out this way. One of the big uh, phrases that they're using a lot of NASA and uh, the government, um, the, the phrase is, we're going to the moon and we're going to stay this time. Um, my point of view on that is, are the technologies there kind of thing? Cause we've, got, we've got all the rocket, rockets, we've got the landers and everything else, but the technology and the human side of it, I haven't seen an awful lot because um, there's still a lot of risk involved because um, moon dust, as you know, gets absolutely everywhere. A little bit of moon dust in inside one of the human landing systems or getting contaminated with anything could be maybe not catastrophic but risky because you don't know the full risks of uh, what happens when the moon dust comes into human contact or it somehow ends up in your breathing it in your lungs and everything like that. Um, in terms of te technology, it's just bouncing back to that. Um, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of interesting technologies in terms of how we're going to start mining on the moon and everything like that. But there's still a lot of technologies that I think they've still got to be de developed and at the end of the day approved, really. What do you guys think on the technological aspect of it in terms of machinery and everything else? we're going to see some amazing stuff off the back of Artemis and we live in a digital generation you know like 
back in Apollo era, it was broadcast on television, and it was grainy quality. I mean, there's a lot of good remastered footage out there, but, you know, technology's progressed to a point now where we're going to be getting real good, high-definition quality video footage of the lunar surface, and we're going to be getting good samples, and we've, we've got a continued man presence there. You know, it's, it's quite important. So how long do you think it will be before we see some kind of, like, AR or VR sort of walk on the moon kind of game where you can stick those VR goggles on and, and with your Vive or what have you and just be able to sort of look around the surface of the moon as if you were there. Do you think that's going to be far off after Artemis? I think Artemis is going to be focusing on a lot more of the uh, important stuff, but they are going to be naturally trying to document as much of the lunar surface as they can. They're going to be taking a lot of samples from a lot of places and the like. So, I mean, I wouldn't put it past NASA to try and map the surface of the moon, given current technology or Artemis generation technology, you know, because it's, it's still four years away. Like, technology is at such an advanced level now where people are getting a new phone every year and if they don't get that phone their old one feels slow you know it's like technology is advancing at such a pace that four years from now you know we could see any kind of equipment that would assist with science like i was listening to a talk at the recent mars society convention and um someone in the crowd actually mentioned that they were working on exploring lava tubes on the moon and that they were actually using the spot rover as a uh, trolley platform and then they were going to build science around spot to actually use on the moon to explore lava tubes that was quite interesting so one of the topics I was also wanting to talk about in regards to the Artemis program tonight, guys, was the uh, Artemis Accords. I don't know if you've actually uh, heard anything about those yet. For me, um, obviously, Donald Trump, the president of America, has mentioned this. Um, he's the one into mine on the moon. How are they going to bring all that material back? It might be radioactive. It might bring have other contaminants in it. It might not. But... There's a lot of risk involved with that, and he's put it out there that they do want to mine and bring some materials back to Earth. So there's that aspect of it. I don't know what the risks are involved with that, and obviously they're bringing tons of material back to Earth. You need a big rocket like Starship to do that, because you're not going to be able to bring tons back in Dynetics, little dinky lander, or Boeing's little lander. You'll need a big ship like starship for, for mining and stuff like that space now have you heard anything about these yet yeah i did sort of you know look a little bit at some of the countries that have already signed the accord i think it raises a lot of interesting points it's nice to see that uh, the uk actually is one of the signatories on on that accord so it's nice to see our country taking the initiative with this sort of thing I mean, we are an innovator in sort of satellite technologies and stuff like that. You know, we are now looking towards becoming a predominantly space launch country. Uh, you know, there's, there's Skyrora, there's Orbex, there's a new spaceport, new laws come in. And, and really, like, I'd recommend folks to check that out if you haven't already. I, I definitely think it's very important that when we do go up there, that I think we leave this idea of being from different you know communities and stuff like that behind us and unite in the common cause of you know scientific research in space um when you unite over a common goal we've seen it several times throughout history when all the people unite towards a common goal you can move mountains and i think that's that's going to be key when you know people from uh, India, the UK, the US, uh, Japan, we all go up there, you know, it, it's no different than talking to your neighbour. And I think that's going to be very important going forward. And, and the Accords are a very good uh, example of that being put into words, as it were. 
Yeah, I mean, at the uh, recent Mars Society convention, I watched a speaker talk about uh, the potential of Earth bacterias um, causing issues on the lunar surface or on the surface of Mars. As more and more people go, you know, is, is there any long-term studies that have been done on that kind of thing? The answer was no. Yeah, and, and you, I think you got the nail on the head there. You know, long-term studies. We haven't really had a chance to conduct these long-term studies with, you know, with almost any, any planetary body, really. So having that presence on the moon is going to enable us to have, you know, long-term research projects there and actually study the effects of, you know, are, are, you know, by going there, are we doing harm to the environment or is, are we going to affect that celestial body in, in some negative way, you know? But uh, there's also the risk of high radiation because you're exposed out in the depths of space, no, no atmosphere to save you like here on Earth. Um, so there's that aspect of it, and you know astronauts have uh, been up in the International Space Station for months and up to up to a year or more up there. But long term, staying up on the moon, we don't know, still don't know the full risks even now. Yeah, and I mean ultimately, you know, the, I think the important thing to think about is when you're inhabiting like Artemis you plan to send astronauts there you know whether that's astronauts cosmonauts taikonauts these people are all pioneers you know they're leading the way forward they're seeing what it's like to live on another planet long term you know what's the mission cycle time we don't know how long could these people stay however we've seen NASA test the limits of how long um, astronauts can do long duration duration space flight on the ISS and now going forward you know NASA will lead the footwork in seeing how long humans can survive off planet and that's quite important yeah definitely you know when you're working in low g or zero g environments we already know that you know we experience bone and muscle wastage and that's why the astronauts up on the ISS have to work out on the resistance machines like they do but when on the surface of the moon, that's going to be slightly different. And I do think that there's going to need to be medical research carried out there into if we're going to be staying there, you know, for as long as we plan to, we need to know how we can live there safely and not end up cutting ourselves off from being able to come back because of the higher G's. So, you know, there's always that to consider as well. And on the Accords, that's quite important going forward, because as we've seen with the International Space Station once again, you know, we do see multinational um, population and a, a peaceful exploration of the universe. And, and you know, as, as far as we can get, as, as far as our species will allow the limits to go over time, you know, like we are going to be a, a spacefaring species. You're not just going to be Chinese or, uh, you know, American or Indian or English or from the States, you know, you're going to be a person from Earth initially or you're going to be somebody born on Mars or any, any other body we manage to occupy, really. I think Elon had it right with that uh, little nugget he printed on the circuit board, do you remember? Made on Earth by humans. Yeah. And that's it. We are human beings going forward, and that's uh, you know that that's sort of like the outline of this entire sort of uh, show, really, isn't it? Is becoming multiplanetary and and a spacefaring species. You know, not just limited to Mars or other celestial bodies. But if Jeff Bezos manages to get one of his rotating space stations, right? You know, uh, you know, with all of this, you know, we're going to the moon now. Um, you've seen when they develop these things, you know, they develop them in them white rooms because they need to know that these things are absolutely sanitary because one of the things the Accords talks about is, you know, us contaminating other worlds with our own bacterium. You know, what, what, you know, how would it feel like if at the end of the day you found life only to realize that you put it there, you know? Yeah, because I mean, planetary protection is quite important. You know, it's 
like I know, I know they're talking about preserving historical sites uh you know like the first landing site and the infamous footprint and the flag and other landing sites for other uh apollo era astronauts and sites of historical significance on the lunar surface and i feel that's good you know future generations are going to be able to um you know visit some of these famous sites you know the ability to take your child to see neil armstrong's boot print on the moon is just wow quite literally out of this world wouldn't you say <laughs> definitely out of this world no you're absolutely right you know preserving these things for the future generations to see you know just how long ago since you know that boot print was there and being able to preserve that and you know your your grandchildren even one day you know, being able to go there, see that, uh, it, it'd be like a, a, one of them school field trips, you know, it'd be quite a casual school field trip, but it, it'd be really touching to know uh, that's happening in the future. I mean, these are all challenges that, that we're faced with, and now watching the Artemis is going to inspire these next generation thinkers, these next generation space pioneers, you know, and, and that's that's the importance of the Artemis missions, really, like, to, to see and hear all the amazing stories from the back of the Apollo moon landings and to know just how historic they were back then when I wasn't around and to know that now I am around and we get to watch that and not only are they going to land again and make new blueprints in the soil but they're actually staying there and they're making many more blueprints and eventually it's going to become commonplace and there's going to be rover tracks and there's going to be activity on the moon and it is going to inspire the next generation of people trying to go multiplanetary, trying to go into space, whether it's space stations or Mars or, you know, a, a various orbiting moons that people try and target or cloud cities, you know, people are going to be inspired watching Artemis Generation astronauts go to the moon. Actually, I encourage anybody listening to go out and stare at the moon on a clear sky and on a on a clear sky's night, and just think of what it takes for these brave men and women that are going and signing up for Artemis generation missions, and think about what it takes for those pioneers to survive on that planet and the amazing efforts of the international space community um, is going to be watching and they are going to be dreaming of one day replicating some of those events. I mean, when I watched Demo 2 with Bob and Doug, I mean, I didn't realise how much it was affecting me until they, they launched and I was seeing them launch and I was just like, go go you know i got so worked up and it's, it really struck a chord with me and that was you know that was inspiring enough for me can you imagine what it's going to be like with the artemis generation and this is it i mean while bob and doug launched america they inspired the world you know and the the, the people now that we're seeing that are training for artemis generation and that are going to be stepping forward to go to the moon these are the people that are going to be in the books of history alongside, you know, previous pioneers. And they're going to do groundbreaking science and groundbreaking research on what life is going to be like off planet. You know, we've never done it before. We've, we've got something orbiting. Fair comment. You know, I'm, I'm not disputing that we've got something orbiting. We've done long duration space flights on the International Space Station. But Artemis, really is testing the unknown you know it's it's the wild west all over again it's people going into the unknown and trying something new for the first time a new gold rush as you will lunar ice is the new gold rush if you wanted to get technical the amount of private startup companies that are looking to get to the moon for polar ice caps there that's the new uh, gold rush you know there's there's a lot of it's a big money business that we're talking because if you can provide water assets to the moon without having to launch them because think about the mass of water 
and think about what it takes to keep astronauts alive. Think about being able to make it on planet. You know, there's a demand for those services. We've got NASA missions coming in. We've got private companies building concepts all focused at, at lunar ice from um, the moon, not just lunar ice. You know, there's, there's talk of uh, deep crater ice and the like that can all be extracted and turned into viable uh, water or other stuff that's that's synthesized from them. We've also got the uh, Dear Moon project going on, haven't we, that's going to slingshot around the moon? Oh, yeah, that Dear Moon stuff. Uh, Meizawa, right? Uh, he's going up in a starship, if I remember right, to orbit the moon with a bunch of artists, I think it was. Um, is there a confirmed list of who's going yet, Space Nut? Do you know? No, there's no confirmed list yet, but he's definitely going to be private citizens, all um, artists from their respective industries, not necessarily just, you know, painters or graphic artists, but like poets and musicians and movie directors and just sort of like people that do produce content to really inspire them um, with, a, with a first-hand view of the moon. Uh, like Ryan was just saying on a on a slingshot attempt, uh, it's it's quite interesting really to think that uh, the everyman, somebody that wasn't ambitious to go into space, all of a sudden he's going around the moon. It's a crazy thought, and when you think about it, if you are someone who is inherently creative, to be presented with something as awe-inspiring as that, you, you've got to think how much an effect that's going to have on that person, you know, with the, in the case of the musicians, what songs will they write when they come back? Or in the case of the artists, you know, what vistas will they see in their mind's eye? It, it's going to be interesting to see what these people go on to do when they come back from that. Yeah, it's like a, an entire sort of legacy is going to leave in the wake of the Dear Moon projects, and I think it's really going to imprint on people. Like, it's no longer just astronauts in space, you know, like, these people have gone to space. You know, like, these so social media influencers that are taking selfies all day and the like, imagine a selfie from space. You know, that's the ultimate flex. He sends some of these big media influencers for various platforms. He send those people to space. You, it's, it's mass publicity. It's it's going to you know encourage people to go, and I think that's where planetary protection is quite important as part of the accords. So shall we talk about what we were going to do with the audience each week, Space Nut? About the questions. Yeah, the audience each week for this show. Um, we sort of had this um, idea of inviting you guys to submit questions direct through the anchor link, um, which I will also post under this episode because I know it's uh, simultaneously spread to multiple outlets. But on anchor specifically, uh, there is a uh, send a message feature where you can send a voice message directly to us. If you'd like to leave a question for us, um, we will answer those questions in the best and most informed way we can each week as part of a segment towards the end of the show. So, yeah, as SpaceNet said, you know, we're going to see if you want to ask questions each week, uh, specifically through the anchor link. And we're going to do our best to answer them each week. And, you know, have a think, you know, what do you think it will take humanity to become multiplanetary? From our species that is slowly waking up to the reality that is being a multiplanetary species, what is it that you guys think that we need to know or we need to be before you know becoming a truly multiplanetary species? And I've also started lining guests up to join us on this new uh, show as well. And hopefully I will be announcing any guests on my Twitter account, Prehand. So if you guys want us to record questions for guests as well, that's also going to be an option. Um, and if you're following myself on Twitter, 
then you'll get advance notice of who those guests are in order to prepare really good questions and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can with the guests each week. So just be sure when if you're wanting to ask a question to one of our guests that week, be sure to mention so at the beginning of your send a message recording. Uh, just mention the to whom the question may be. That link, if you'd like to leave us any questions, is anchor.fm slash total space. Speaking of which, guys, if you're listening in at the moment, you, you're liking what you hear about all this stuff on the moon, um, and if you enjoy a good game, uh, highly recommend Moonbase Alpha if you haven't tried it yet. A uh, really good uh, lunar-based game. And I believe NASA was directly involved with it. Like, I also have a really good video game recommendation. I recently installed Take on Mars, uh, the recommendation of a friend. And that is pretty cool. You know, you can do rover missions, uh, human landing missions. Not that, you know, I'm, I'm not endorsing any products here. It's just simply, if you enjoy space games, I would definitely recommend Take on Mars. Speaking of space games, did you try SpaceX's... Um docking simulator at all i would be a very invaluable asset to spacex i would destroy so much equipment courtesy of my um, time on the docking simulator <laughs> i tried it myself and i got i got fairly close but for some reason right at the end i just completely veered off course as i got to the last part and i'm like oh man this this takes a lot of concentration for a long time to just get that right and you when they say the trick is you have to be slow, they weren't kidding. Yeah, think about these remote missions to uh, the Lunar Gateway and astronauts taking over control uh, of the asset upon arrival and then having to guide them in. You know, think about how skilled you need to do that using robotic arms like we've seen with the Canada Arm and the Canada Arm. Uh, Canada Arm 2 and actually being able to uh, gra grab these crafts and you know it's, it takes quite a bit of skilled training I think So that's about it for this week's episode guys. Massive thanks to another Space Nut, Ryan for joining us this week be sure to give us a like and or subscribe if you enjoyed the content and next week you can look forward to our new topic which is going to be about reaching Mars. I've been Rich LB and I'm another Space Nut Remember to like and subscribe this episode. Here on the Total Space Network, we're uploading the three shows. We're uploading Talking Space, where myself, Ryan, and Miko are hosting, as well as guests may occasionally come on. We're taking deep dive episodes. Um, you can check that out in episode two. Myself and Miko discuss drone ships. And then we'll also be regularly uploading this show. Thanks for listening today, guys. And I'm Ryan from the Space Updates. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, you can catch me on Talking Space uh, next week or one of the other Deep Dive podcasts later in the week. And this has been Becoming Multiplanetary. Mm -hmm.